To determine the stochastic risk, the pathways of radiation exposure are considered. External radiation will affect the skin, and if penetrating and localised, the organs directly in its path. Inhaled sources will affect the lungs, and ingested sources, the gastrointestinal tract, or, if it is able to pass into the blood, may be concentrated in a particular organ or tissue type, an example of which might be the uptake of radioactive iodine in the thyroid gland. Some radioactive materials may be incorporated into any organ in the body. One such example is tritium, the radioactive form of hydrogen, which may be incorporated into any of the hydrocarbons that form organic matter, or may even be taken in in the form of water, where tritium replaces some of the hydrogen normally bound to oxygen in this compound. Each of the different organs will have different masses and sizes, so a given deposition of energy will give an organ averaged equivalent dose that is dependent not only on the radiation type, but also on the organ type. Further, different organs will carry different risks of leading to cancers or childbirth defects or inherited conditions. For example, irradiating the ovaries or testes may lead to genetic damage in offspring, while irradiating bone marrow may lead to the future development of leukemia. This leads to a complex assessment when trying to determine the risk from a given equivalent dose. To simplify matters, the concept of an effective dose may be introduced. The effective dose is the sum of all the equivalent doses to all the tissues which is weighted to account for the risk associated with a particular tissue type. For example, bone marrow, the lungs, stomach and colon have a high weighting as damage leads to a reasonable risk of carcinogenesis, while the esophagus, bladder and liver have a lesser risk and consequently a lower weighting factor. The gonads have an intermediate rating as damage leads to a risk of birth defects in children. When all the contributions are summed in this way, the risk of detrimental effects from the individual doses is the same as that from a uniform whole body dose. The weighting factors applied in this sum are so-called tissue weighting factors, and because the combined risks are equal to the whole body risk, the sum of all the tissue weighting factors must equal 1. Or, viewed from another perspective, a whole body dose will be broken up into fractions that give detrimental effects on different parts of the body in proportion to the tissue's sensitivity to radiation. To illustrate this, consider a radioactive particle that is inhaled and lodges in the lungs where it irradiates the local tissue. If the activity is such that the equivalent dose to the lung is 100 millisieverts, then we can work out the effective whole body dose by applying the lung weighting factor of 0.12 to 100 millisieverts so that the risk of detrimental effects from this is the same as those that would arise from a whole body dose of 12 millisieverts from, say, an external x-ray source. The induced effect from this whole body dose may not necessarily be a cancer in the lungs, but the fact that it affects all organs means that the overall risk of developing cancer anywhere in the body or producing birth defects is the same as the risk of developing lung cancer in the lung particle specific case. If the same radioactive particle were to be concentrated in the liver, the weighting factor is 0.04 rather than 0.12, indicating a lower susceptibility to detrimental effects. In this case, the risk would be the same as those that would arise from a whole body dose of 4 millisieverts. The effective dose is not necessarily measured directly by radiation detectors, which would detect the local ambient count. However, the use of a tissue equivalent filter affixed to the detector would allow a good prediction of the likely whole body exposure. When considering internal doses, we should also account for the behaviour of the radioactive source and the biology of the organ in which the material is concentrated. This is the committed dose which relates to total cumulative damage that occurs while the particle is in the body over a lifetime, which is usually taken as 50 years in working adults. As a source decays, the total energy released reduces so that the absorbed dose has the same half-life as the decay half-life. This means that the absorbed dose rate is not constant over the life of an individual unless the material's half-life is significantly longer than 50 years. A second effect is due to biological removal which, as with activity, depends on the amount of material present and so can be modelled as another exponential reduction with a biological removal rather than decay half-life, which is, in general, different from the decay half-life. The rate of biological removal will depend on both the organ and source material. To illustrate this, consider the ingestion of polonium-210. Ingested polonium is concentrated in the spleen and liver, where it decays with a half-life of just over 138 days.
If the polonium were to irradiate these organs, the dose rate would fall exponentially, and after about two and a half years, it would be less than 1% of its initial value. This approach would overestimate the dose, however, as the body removes polonium by excretion, so that the effective half-life is about 31 days. This secondary removal mechanism reduces the overall committed dose by 75-80%. to 80%. Once a method of assessing doses has been established, a regulatory framework can be constructed that places limits on the doses that may be received by employees and the public. Limits for adult employees are higher than those for employers under 18, which are higher still than those for the general public. The limits are primarily stated as a limit on the whole body effective dose. Within this, secondary limits based on equivalent dose to the lens of the eye and to the skin, hands, forearms, feet and ankles are also applied. A separate limit applies to the equivalent dose allowable to the abdomen of a woman with childbearing capacity.